Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Michael Walker. It's a Wednesday evening and I'm joined by Dahlia Gabriel. Dahlia, how are you doing? I'm doing well. All the better for hearing your voice, Michael. <laughs> oh, that's very, um, I'm, I'm very touched and moved by that, actually. Uh, we have some, we've got a, a nice variety of stories for you this evening. Westminster honey traps. Um, what should we make of William Ragg having resigned the Tory whip after falling for um, a, a, a fake chirps uh, and, and, and ending up being blackmailed? Little clue. I was also uh, the honey trapper trying to get me within their trap. So we'll be talking about that. Um, at the end of the show, we are going to talk about the war of words between Israel and Iran. Before that, though, it's all about the CAS review. A damning review into NHS services for trans children has been published, and its findings have proven controversial. The review was commissioned by NHS England in 2020 and was conducted by Dr. Hilary Cass, a former president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. In the review, Cass critiques existing gender identity services for focusing too quickly on gender-based medical interventions at the expense of what Cass calls a more holistic approach. And one area where she critiques youth gender healthcare concerns the use of puberty blockers, about which she writes this. Based on a single Dutch study, which suggested that puberty blockers may improve psychological well-being for a narrowly defined group of children with gender incongruence, the practice spread at pace to other countries. This was closely followed by a greater readiness to start masculinizing or feminizing hormones in mid-teens, and the extension of this approach to a wider group of adolescents who would not have met the inclusion criteria for the original Dutch study. Some practitioners abandoned normal clinical approaches to holistic assessment, which has meant that this group of young people have been exceptionalized compared to other young people with similarly complex presentations. They deserve very much better. Um, that judgment there on puberty blockers has already led the NHS to ban their prescription to children experiencing gender dysphoria. The report also weighs in on the debate about why we are seeing such an increase in people presenting to the NHS for gender-related services and why that increase has been particularly large among people assigned female at birth. Now, on that issue, the report says this. A common explanation put forward is that the increase in presentation is because of greater acceptance. While it certainly seems to be the case that there is much greater acceptance of trans identities, particularly among younger generations, which may account for some of the increase in numbers, the exponential change in referrals over a particularly short five-year time frame is very much faster than would be expected for normal evolution of acceptance of a minority group. This also does not adequately explain the switch from birth-registered males to birth-registered females, which is unlike trans presentation in any prior historical period. Um, and then on that question, she goes on to say this, Research suggests gender expression is likely determined by a variable mix of factors, such as biological predisposition, early childhood experiences, sexuality, and expectations of puberty. For some, mental health difficulties are hard to disentangle. The impact of a variety of contemporary societal influences and stresses, including online experience, remains unclear. Peer influence is also very powerful during adolescence, as are different generational perspectives. Hilary Cass also said that all children experiencing gender dysphoria were being let down by waiting lists that were far too long and complained that a toxic and polarized debate about trans issues had made clinicians afraid to express their views. Earlier today, Hilary Cass explained some of her findings on Radio 4. What's unfortunately happened for these young people is that because of the toxicity of the debate, They've often been bypassed by local services who've been really nervous about seeing them. So rather than doing the things that they would do for other young people with depression or anxiety or perhaps undiagnosed autistic spectrum disorder, they've tended to pass them straight on to the JID service. And they then ended up at the back of a very long waiting list because JIDS wasn't really um, able to cope with the rising numbers and the complexity of their presentations. So Hilary Cass was quite clear there. She's saying that young people with gender distress, but also other issues, currently go to their usual medical professional for support, say a GP, and then partly because of the divisive nature of the topic, that GP immediately refers them directly to the NHS Gender Identity Service known as 
jids. Um, that would then set them on a pathway they might otherwise not have gone down. That's the, the idea that's being expressed there. Um, someone impressed by Cass's findings is the journalist Hannah Barnes, who wrote a book critiquing the NHS's treatment of people with gender dysphoria. She spoke to Good Morning Britain. Well, what Dr Cass is saying is that in the past, when a young person was seen by the Gender Identity Development Service at the Tavistock, they would generally only look at that person through the, the prism of gender, if you like. So they would look at their gender-related distress and often wouldn't look at what else was going on for that mm. young person. Like their autism or other... Exactly. Or, 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 or... Yeah, and what clinicians, so many clinicians have told me who worked there who were very worried is saying, well, we saw that these young people arrived at their gender distress in very different ways. That, and that meant there were kind of going to be different ways out of it as well, and that wasn't being offered. The only treatment... So they came pathway, forward and they were directed down a path of various treatments for their gender distress. Well, there really was one treatment quickly. pathway, which was a referral for puberty blockers. Now, that's not to say that, that every child was referred, or indeed the majority, but that was the only proper treatment. And it's mm. quite striking that in, in today's report from, from Hilary Cash, she says, we asked Jids what were the alternatives, and they actually weren't able to come up with anything. So what should happen, in your view? Well... I would say I'm, I'm not a medic, I'm not no. a clinician. So it, it's, but in your findings? Well, it, it, what, what's being recommended today is the right pathway. You take a young person and you treat them as an individual, as a, as a whole being. So Barnes there is painting the same picture as Cass. Children have been getting referred to the NHS Gender Identity Service and once they're there, they're only treated for gender dysphoria, not other conditions which may or may not be contributing to their gender distress. That's the idea putting forward. Um, or being put forward, sorry. The government has welcomed the review. Of course we must treat children who are questioning their gender with compassion and sensitivity, but we have to recognise that we need to move with extreme caution in these areas uh, because we just simply don't know the long-term impacts of what this all means and children's wellbeing is uppermost in our mind and that's why we've acted on the interim findings previously, whether that's the NHS banning the routine use of puberty blockers or indeed the guidance that we gave to schools about how to treat these issues uh, in those environments which again were warmly welcomed. I've been very consistent on this topic throughout my uh, career and I want to make sure that we consider this report carefully but we've already acted on the interim findings and as I said it's very much in uh, alignment with our way of thinking which is to exercise extreme caution on these issues because we simply do not know the long-term consequences of impacts. So Sunak has said the government will consider the report very carefully. Labour though have gone one step further and said they'll accept its findings in full. A Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting posted this on Twitter. Today's report must provide a watershed moment for the NHS's gender identity services. The government must now immediately act. But if they do not, the next Labour government will work to implement the expert recommendations of the CAS review to ensure that young people are receiving appropriate and high quality care. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper spoke to Sky. The report is very clear that children and young people have been badly let down and have been receiving treatment that's not based on evidence. So I think the CAS review is really important. We welcome it. Labour accepts all of its recommendations. I think they should be implemented now as swiftly as possible. And we would like to work with the government on doing that. And what would you like to say to those um, doctors, clinicians, um, who felt that they couldn't speak out because if they did, they would be victimised. Well, I hope that this report really is a watershed moment for the NHS, for NHS gender services, because this is, it, the, the report's clear, it's basically talking about evidence, focusing on evidence, focusing on children's welfare and not having all of this get caught up in, in culture wars or in different kinds of de those debates, instead be able to just put the child at the centre of the support that the NHS should give them. Now, comments like that and the other um, comments we've played you might make it sound as if the CAS review pretty much settles the debate on gender identity care. But the report and its recommendations are highly controversial, including among many trans people. Earlier today, I spoke to the sociologist and co-director of the Feminist Gender Equality Network, Natasha Kennedy. The CAS review ignored most of the evidence that's available. It said, we're only going to choose high quality evidence 
uh, of the highest at the highest level. And that is always a randomized control trial, blind trial. I was involved in one of those when I was I was a volunteer tester for uh, one of the vaccines. Yeah, I wasn't told which vaccine I was given. You know, you can do it with things like that, but you can't have a randomized control trial for uh, gender reassignment surgery because people will know if they've been given hormones or haven't been given hormones. And it's also quite unethical to do that, to say, well, we might give you hormones and we might not. And you won't know until uh, you start puberty or, or something like that. It, it's it's unethical. They excluded everything except one, I think it was one randomized control. That has, has basically resulted in almost no evidence that, that for existing treatments. What they've proposed for new treatments, they have provided, as far as I can see, no evidence for that. Certainly no randomized control trials, no observation trials, nothing. And when you think about it, 90% of medicine, I think, is based on observational trials, not randomized control trials. They are asking for a much higher standard of evidence to support what is actually going on and then they are dismissing most of that evidence but what they're proposing is not based on any evidence at all from what i can see not even observational evidence maybe in some cases observational evidence but nothing major certainly nothing of the level which they are demanding and dissing uh, are for other treatments it's going to be taking away access to healthcare. It's trying to block children from socially transitioning in, in school and places like that um, until they've seen a doctor about it. You know, who else needs to have a doctor's permission to get a haircut, wear different clothes and change their name? It's, it's literally, it's a human rights issue for, for children. If you take out things like um, social transitioning, you are um, uh, you are also taking out that affirmation. Um, being affirmed as to who you are, taking that away is hugely psychologically problematic for a lot of people. That was Natasha Kennedy speaking to me earlier today. And I'm now joined live by Dr. Aidan Kelly, a clinical psychologist and the clinical director at Gender Plus. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, what's your verdict on, on the CAS review? I mean, I guess on first viewing, um, it looks like sensible stuff. You want better health care, more evidence, um, more accessible care, less lists, uh, people, holistic care, being able to get your needs met. I think the, the question I have in my mind, the question of what I'm left with is, how is any of this going to be implemented? It's taken kind of... Three and a half years from since when the CAS was, um, report was first or review was first commissioned in September 2020 to get to this point. Most of what's been said on the face of it kind of sounds like common sense. However, what do you do and how are we going to put this in place? We can't wait another three and a half years for that to happen. There's lots of really distressed um, young people that, that need support and, and sadly are kind of seeking that in in unsafe, unregu un unregulated, unregistered places at the moment. And some people are saying it seems like common sense, you know, people from all sides of the perspective. I know Stonewall actually put out sort of a, a, a commentary that sort of said, you know, they were a bit more open to the the report's findings than some people had had expected. I think that's maybe because people are interpreting what's been said in, in somewhat different ways. Um, I, I know you used to work at the Gender Identity Development Service, so JIDS, and I mean, the report is 388 pages long. I'm not going to pretend I've read it all today. Um, but lots of the commentary surrounding the the report and the interviews which have been given are suggesting, um, you know, that JIDS was not open minded enough about the people who were presenting to them. So they sort of I, I, the idea that care needs to be more holistic. I mean, implicit in that is the idea that it wasn't holistic enough before. And if someone was presenting with gender dysphoria, but also a lot of other issues, um, when they presented to JIDS, they just say, okay, well, are you trans or are you not? They wouldn't say, well, let's talk about the, the potential autism. Let's talk about uh, other pressures you might be under. Is that a sort of 
evaluation of JIDs that you recognize as someone that used to work there? I mean, I guess there's, I think what's important to understand is that JIDs was commissioned by NHS England and given a, set, like a, a contract, a set of protocols with, within which it had to function and operate. It couldn't assess for autism. It couldn't um, deliver th- other mental health therapies because it was strictly un- and prohibited from doing that. What happened in JIDs when you identified those needs, you had to refer to what often was called CAMS, so the local child and adolescent mental health service in the area that that person, li- uh, that that person lived, which sadly could mean that you could be, that, that young person might then go on the back of an Another really long waiting list and so you're trying to support and manage um, the, the care of a young person when your hands are kind of tied behind your back and you're not able to actually deliver everything so I think it's unfair I think JIDS has become the kind of fall guy in all of this and I guess I think what we'll see in time is that although JIDS has gone it closed last month and um, the problem hasn't gone away how is this actually going to be delivered because this kind of synopsis or, or version of where things are at in 2024 was was there in tw- in 2020 when it got um it got commissioned but in fact we're now in a far worse position wait lists are far longer so the people coming to the top of the wait list now have been waiting far longer and and we all know that in kind of mental health or issues related to mental health, if you intervene earlier, it's, 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 it's more effective and it's easier. But now you're going to be dealing with people who've had been sitting on waste for far longer and there's going to be lots of complexity. So I think, you know, the, the review is all well and good, but I can understand your previous caller and other people's callers, uh, other people's views that it, it's quite sceptical views that I, I fail to kind of hold out the hope that it's going to be the watershed moment that people are kind of uh, um, kind of positioning it as really. What's your perspective on some of the specific issues? So on puberty blockers. Now, it doesn't seem to me that there were, you know, thousands of people being prescribed puberty blockers anyway. But this report sort of seems to suggest that the NHS is going to go from a more positive perspective on puberty blockers prescribed, sorry, to to young people, to teenagers, to uh, much more sceptical, indeed, banning the NHS from prescribing puberty blockers to teenagers. What's your sort of perspective on on that particular recommendation? Yeah, I guess um, I think it's England, Sweden and Finland are the only three countries that I know of who have kind of put in place this mandatory clinical trial to access something like a puberty blocker. Um, And we're kind of out of step with the international kind of community on this. Um, I think the, the kind of the, uh, the numbers we're talking about here, I think over 10 years, there was a thousand young people started on the puberty block. So like 100 per year, more or less. So it's in, in terms of the bigger picture and the wider numbers, it's a really, really small kind of cohort within the wider cohort that this actually impacts. But the conversation is dominated by this. Of course, we need to be really careful with young people's lives. And of course, it would be wonderful if we had rock solid evidence. But I think as your previous call and Ash was pointing out, it's it's almost next to impossible to get that. And in pediatric healthcare, the majority of um, um, kind of treatments that are delivered are delivered off label and without those randomized control trials to support it. So it would be wonderful to have the evidence. But again, I'm kind of left with the question in my mind, how is that going to be done? Will that be ethical? And is it even deliverable, really, I suppose? On that question of of evidence, obviously, N- Natasha brought it up in her sort of intervention um, when I spoke to her earlier. But that seems to have dominated really a lot of the the discussion on social media is this accusation that the CAS review sort of systematically ignored um, any evidence that was in favour of what's sort of called gender affirming care. So someone comes to you with gender dysphoria and you sort of very affirming of what they're saying. Okay, you maybe you were trans, you know. So, And uh, people are saying that all of the studies that suggest that is the right way to go were excluded um, and people sort of seem to be suspecting some sort of bias there. What's your perspective on that? And the gold standard kind of evidence-based practice, so the idea that you would only um, kind of practice in a way that there's a, a kind of a, a solid evidence base to support that. But I think, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the vast majority of, of healthcare operates on a, a practice based evidence, i.e. the clinical expertise that people gain by actually doing the work, knowing how helpful this is, knowing how um, uh, and how this can operate and function over a long period of time. That um, that voice or that seems to be excluded from this review. So I guess in a way, I'm not surprised that she drew the conclusions that she did based on the methodology she set up to, to kind of run that trial. I think, again, um, it's a pity that this might mean that, well, this looks like it will mean that 
some people who might benefit from treatment will lose out on being able to access that. And I don't know what the, I guess it seems like the, the needs of one kind of small minority of, of young people who may have kind of um, poor outcomes in this pathway seems to kind of outweigh the, the needs of the majority who, who, who seem to do well based on clinical experience. What you're suggesting is that puberty blockers, I mean, as you said, they haven't been prescribed to that many people, but for the people to whom they have been described, prescribed, sorry, in most cases, the outcomes have been positive. People have had a, um, a sort of consistent or long-term trans identity. And the fact that they took puberty blockers has, has made their lives easier. But there have been a small number of what's called detransitioners. So someone who sort of starts on uh, a process of gender transition and then changes their mind. And you think that maybe we're focusing too much on this small group of detransitioners, and that could be at the expense of many people for whom puberty blockers could be incredibly useful. Based on my clinical experience, yes, absolutely. And it does seem to me, like I, I'm not an expert on this, and for me, I feel like all sides in this debate do seem somewhat reasonable. I mean, obviously, there's just a lot of bigots and there's a lot of people who, who seem very dogmatic, right? But it seems to me really difficult how one would gather an evidence base because of the increase in people who are presenting themselves. Because from my perspective, if you've got, say, the people presenting 10 years ago as maybe being trans are probably quite different to the people presenting today. And so if I'm thinking of this on a spectrum, so you might also say that the way I'm thinking about this is completely wrong. But if I'm thinking that some degree on a spectrum, there are some people who I imagine were, you know, born 100% trans, they were always going to be trans, they can't possibly be happy unless they transition. And there's some people who are cis, they're always going to be cis, you know, they never even thought about being tra trans. And I imagine there's a, quite a few people in the middle. And the fact that it's become more socially acceptable to be trans, that makes me feel like there'll be more people, you know, in the past, whereas you might be at really one end of the spectrum to present yourself to a gender identity service, because, you know, it's really difficult. So you have to be really certain to present to yourself. I would imagine that the more socially acceptable it becomes the more people in the middle are presenting themselves and so the cohort we're looking at is constantly changing which seems to me to make it somewhat impossible to to really have any certainty or to to sort of collect evidence as we go along if the coach do you see where i'm coming from here no absolutely and i think the sort of evidence dr cass is kind of saying that you would like it would probably take five to ten probably ten years to be able to achieve that and so you know, and then by then the, the cohort might have changed again. And I suppose, I guess that's why this isn't always the kind of common practice in, in all areas of, of, of medical care. It's kind of the best if you can achieve it. But actually, um, the realities of the world don't always allow for it. And so it's not always practically possible to do. And that's why I kind of think um, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect between the theory behind this and the, the kind of ability to implement a lot of it. I think it's always good to want the best for people. Um, but we have to also look at what are going to be the outcomes or the implications for taking the approach that we're taking right now. Um, because it will be a, a generation of trans young people that will kind of likely miss out on access to, to healthcare, really. To end, I suppose, there will be presumably people watching this discussion who might be young um, and might think that they might be trans, right? Um, so what does this report mean for them? And I suppose some context here. I have seen lots of sort of people or discussions on social media. I mean, the document is 388 pages long. As I say, I haven't read the whole thing. I doubt many people in the country have now. This is not to say no one should comment on it before they've read the whole 388 pages. I think that'd be a ridiculous thing to suggest. But there is sort of, you know, people are suggesting that the report says no one's going to be able to transition until they're 25. Um, that seemed to me to be the sort of most concerning one. I suppose, uh, are there concerns that you can allay or do you think people who are sort of looking at this and are genuinely worried um, that they will be, you know, prevented from transitioning if they really want to? I mean, what would be your your advice or... How should people be interpreting this if they think they might be trans and they're a young person? Yeah, I mean, I guess the first thing today, I suppose, is that a medical transition can be uh, part of the answer, but it's never, I guess, the whole answer. And so having people around you that kind of accept you and support you, having, um, you know, whether that be family members, friends, if it's teachers at school, so being able to kind of... Um, and address and express yourself in the way that you you wish is you know is it's super important as a first step on the 
on the journey and the pathway, I suppose. I think there's sadly a reality to the fact that our NHS system has been kind of inaccessible for kind of four or five years now anyway. And so, um, although it's not a good thing, I guess in a way we're in probably in no worse a situation than we were previously because the system was already in, in, inaccessible, I suppose. And many people have been ha ha having to find out different ways of, of kind of accessing the healthcare they need. I think linking in with a, a local trans or LGBT support group is really, really important. Finding people that will support you, that understand what you're going through um, and, and will accept you for who you are is, is really, really important. Um, it is important to obviously take time to think and reflect on these things. Adolescence is a is a, is a it's a kind of a critical time in, in terms of identity development. You know, I, we in my service, Gender Plus, we you know we're very neutral in terms of whether people continue to identify as trans or they um, might come to identify in a, in a different way. The main thing is that young people are supported to be happy and kind of have meaningful lives, and that should be our primary kind of goal as a as a healthcare professional. And it's kind of almost secondary whether they would access medical treatment or not. Although, of course, it can be helpful. So I'm not saying not access, but I guess it's it's not the whole answer. And I think there's lots of social supports that can be put in place um, and then access your local communities to find out what's available um, around you. Um, and we'll, you know, in the, in the professional healthcare system, you know, myself and my colleagues who've kind of, I guess, left NHS gender service, probably for this precise reason that we're frustrated not being able to use our skills and, and knowledge base in the best way possible. And we would love to be delivering it in a public healthcare setting, but hasn't been possible. And so we've set up independently, I hope there'll be more independent um, services that will be able to kind of uh, meet the needs of, of, of some of the young people. It's not ideal. Unfortunately, there are fee paying um, aspects to that, but we have had people who've been able to access funding for those. And so there are alternatives and ways of trying to access a service. And I guess the main thing is that you get kind of acceptance and support, really. Dr. Raiden Kelly, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think that, that point about only a thousand people having... Um taken puberty blockers over the last 10 years it does as i say i i, I do actually think there are some genuinely very difficult questions here that i don't know the answer to but that that 1000 over 10 years does make me feel like some of these issues have been politicized to a degree that they really don't need to be tory mp william rag has resigned the party whip after being at the center of a honey trap scandal in westminster it follows Rag resigning as vice chair of the 1922 committee of Tory backbenchers and as chair of a parliamentary committee. Rag was lured in by a scammer under the name of Charlie on the dating app Grinder, and after sharing explicit images of himself with the individual, Rag then shared phone numbers of other MPs who were then contacted by the account. The initial response to Rag coming clean on the honey trap had been surprisingly positive. This was Jeremy Hunt speaking last week. I think the events of the last few days uh, have been a great cause for concern. Uh, the MP involved has given a courageous and fulsome apology. But the lesson here for all MPs is that they need to be very careful about cyber security. So that was Jeremy Hunt sounding very forgiving. Over time, though, more MPs have come out with criticisms of RAG. This was Jacob Rees-Mogg on Monday. Judge not that ye be not judged. These are words that should be seared on the heart of every sensible politician. In a career of any length, all politicians make, make mistakes, and they should not be too harshly criticised by other politicians as long as they're made in good faith and with the right intention. It's different if they're incompetent or acting in bad faith. Now, William Ragg, who is at the centre of a storm, has never followed this advice and has always been willing in his glass house to throw stones when people have fallen below his high standards. So the question arises of how much sympathy does he deserve for falling for a pretty obvious honey trap, sending deeply insalubrious photographs over the internet and then revealing telephone numbers that he held as a matter of trust for other politicians. Chance the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, thinks he's courageous. But can somebody who is simply so silly remain as vice chairman of the very powerful 1922 committee and as the chairman of the Public Administration Committee? So RAG has um, since stood down from both of those roles, as you'll know. Um, so what was the nature of this honey trap? Well, from the Times, um, they say the identity of the honey trapper 
and of the people pictured in the social media accounts they used, has been the subject of much speculation in Westminster. They appear to have been operating for more than a year and have targeted disparate groups of people involved in politics, including during last year's Labour conference in the aftermath of the mid-Bedfordshire by-election and as recently as last month. And Politico reports this. To date, Politico has verified directly that at least 21 people in UK politics were sent unsolicited WhatsApp messages by one or both of two phone numbers, which alternatively use the names Charlie or Abby. All victims verified by Politico are men, mostly aged between their late 20s and early 40s. They are a mixture of straight and gay. Among them are Labour and Tory MPs, including a serving minister in the UK government. At least two other Conservative MPs um, also sent explicit messages of themselves to the scammer, um, but there's no suggestion they were successfully blackmailed. There's no suggestion they gave over um, phone numbers to this scammer. Um, Now, it's interesting that the Honey Trapper was apparently at last year's Labour Party conference because that's when I got a message from them. Yes, um, I was somewhat flattered um, that I am deemed worthy of blackmailing. Uh, But I got a message from Charlie uh, last year at Labour Party conference. I have to say, and this is what you might not understand if you're not a young gay man. When someone messages you out of the blue and says, we spoke six months ago on Grindr, your response is often like, oh, yeah, that's plausible. Uh, So that was my response. Oh, yeah, that's plausible. Chatted for a bit. Uh, He sent lots of pictures. Then I was like, what's your Insta? What's your Instagram? And then at that point, it was like, wouldn't send the Instagram. I was like, seems like you're not real then. Um, And then obviously, I didn't get blackmailed because I have some internet literacy. Um, So if you're wondering, why the hell would anyone reply to them? Like, that's I did reply. Uh, but then I asked the question to make sure that they're a real person and they clearly weren't a real person. Um, Dahlia, have you ever been catfished? Have you been blackmailed? I mean, I get around this by basically never answering messages to anyone, even people I know. It's also how I avoid being scammed. I never I never pick up my phone. Um, but I, I mean, I can, on the one hand, I can completely understand how something like this would happen and i think in some of the reporting there was like this undertone of you know as is often the case like you know trevor phillips was saying you know this isn't your typical suburban set of behaviors and i just think some of that stuff is a bit of a dog whistle and kind of implying that because this happened on grinder and because it happened between two men that sometimes somehow it's like more embarrassing or like more salacious when you know this is like what people, you know, people date on apps, like people hook up on apps, like it's not a big deal. Um, But I do think that when you are a public figure, and particularly when you are a political representative, unfortunately, like that does just come with the baggage of not being able to do certain things. And that's not, you know, I think it's totally fine to reply to messages to obviously meet people for dates and whatever, but you do have to be careful when it comes to things like exchanging explicit messages. Even if you really trust the person, you know, things can be hacked. Your phone, you know, your iCloud can be hacked. Your the person who's who you're sending it to, their iCloud could be hacked. You just have to be extremely careful about the kinds of things that you post and the kinds of things that you send because that just comes with the territory of being a public figure. And when you're a political representative, there is that added layer of possible blackmail. And it's just really unacceptable, I think, for him to have, you know, put him, his colleagues in danger. You know, in the past 10 years, two MPs have been killed. We heard the testimony from Diane Abbott not that long ago, where she says that she feels really vulnerable walking around the streets in Hackney, where she's the MP, where she lives, because she knows that from the from the top to the bottom, from, you know, Tory donors down to trolls on social media, she, you know, people have like, like violently threatened her. And I think given that vulnerability, it's so unbelievable. Like I would be absolutely furious if I found out that Navara colleagues or people that I work with were handing out my number or any kind of private information to someone who clearly has ill intentions. And I'm just incredibly surprised that A, MPs don't have to go through some kind of 
awareness training or that there's no apparent process for what MPs can do if they've, you know, screwed up and ended up in this situation because it it happens. It does happen. And so I'm just stunned that it got to the point where he, you know, could actually like actually didn't know what to do or there wasn't some kind of process to follow because I can imagine that MPs are extremely vulnerable to this. And it should have been that once he had, you know, sent those messages, sent the, I believe sent pictures. That's the the implication. We obviously don't know exactly. And found that this person was going to try and use it for blackmail. I'm shocked that there's not some kind of protocol that MPs can go through that will protect them or that like procedure that doesn't involve them just doing whatever the blackmailer asks them to do. So, you know, on the one hand, like Jacob Rees-Mogg taking uh, the moral high ground on things like this and talking about whether or not someone does or does not deserve sympathy um, is not really relevant. The question is, how could an MP have been so ill-equipped to deal with what I can imagine is something that MPs are comp- quite vulnerable to because of the nature of their position. Um, And, you know, it is completely unacceptable that he ended up compromising the safety of his colleagues, particularly at a time when, you know, MPs face escalating violent threats and two MPs have been killed in the past 10 years. I actually thought sort of the, the positive responses to it becoming public were a bit weird. Like Jeremy Hunt saying he's done an incredibly brave thing because it is really stupid right i mean the the the, the, the stupidest moment is sent if you are in the public eye don't send a picture to someone you haven't met that you would probably don't even send a picture to someone you have met unless they're really really close to you that you wouldn't mind going public i, I will admit now i've ex, i've sent explicit pictures to people i haven't met on grinder but i would never send one if i to a stranger if i cared about it going public which means don't include your face in it or if you do include your face in it, make sure you look really, really good. That's always my, my policy. If this were to be leaked, so be it. I look good in that picture. Uh, but clearly that wasn't clearly that wasn't the situation with William Rag, uh, which was his biggest mistake. He sent a picture to a stranger, and it's a picture that if it were he was he was presumably so worried about it being leaked that he, as you say, passed on sensitive information about other MPs. I want to talk a bit about who this person might be because interestingly here, so William Rag, what they say, he was blackmailed and gave over MP gave over phone numbers to Tory MPs, which if you've got an MP, if you've got something so, you know, powerful over an MP, you've got a picture of them that they really don't want to get leaked. The idea that all you'd get from them is phone numbers also seems a bit strange because this person, when they messaged me in September last year or October, whatever it was, they had my number. Um, And so either they also blackmailed like a left-wing person who would have my number, you know, because there are, you know, left-wing MPs or left-wing people have my number, or they were someone who was already in the journalist media sphere. Because lots of people do have my number Mm. in the media because loads of TV producers have my number. Um, So I feel like they probably are like a muckraking journalist or a muckraking sort of parliamentary operative or researcher or something. I, I think they were someone in this world. Also, the way they spoke was very much in this world. The way they t- spoke about conference, they're also clearly a gay man the way they spoke, unless they're like really good at like acting. So to me, it seems like this is a gay man, journalist or parliamentary operative. And if that's the case, who just wanted some embarrassing dirt on someone, um, either as a power play or so like f- for, a, for an article or yeah, to, to get favors from people. So... If that's who they were, it seems to me that it'd be quite easy to get the phone numbers of Tory MPs anyway. And so if you've got a naked picture of William Rag and you're going to blackmail them, if all you get from them is MPs of other phone numbers, this seems a bit weak to me. So, th- you know, I, I don't want to, I don't, I, I have no idea what happened, but it, there's, there's some parts of this story that seem a bit like, is there more than we're being told? What do you think, Dahlia? Yeah, I felt exactly the same way because I'm also like, okay, you get an MP's phone number, like then what? You, you're going to call them and ask them some compromising questions? Like they might, they'll just not pick up the phone to you. Like they, like it's not like MP's, whoever calls their phone, they just spill all the beans to you. Like if they're going to to tell a journalist something, it's because they know that journalist, they trust that journalist. They're not just going to get a cold call from someone 
and then just, you know, tell them a bunch of things, which is why I also am inclined to believe that he handed over other kinds of information, um, whether it is, and obviously this is all alleged, I don't know anything for sure, but because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that someone would go to all this trouble um, to to just get a bunch of MPs phone numbers that they'll probably just, that, that it doesn't, it, it's not entirely clear what they can get from that. So it to does, be- I do wonder if there's more, if there's more that was handed over that we're not being told about. So the phone numbers, so to be clear, what whoever this hacker was, or scammer was, so how it worked is they they met or they spoke to William Rag on Grinder, and then after William Rag mm. gave this person the numbers of male Tory MPs, they tried the same thing on those male Tory MPs via WhatsApp. So it was a way of trying to mm. get compromise on other Tory MPs. So th- that's that's what they did to me right. was via WhatsApp. So it was they WhatsApp me oh, saying like, right. "Hey, are you at conference? Um, you know, we it'd be good to see you." And I was like, "I've I've got a new phone. Who is this?" And they were like, "Oh, we chatted on Grinder." last year and i was like well, that mm, is plausible mm. so it was it was they okay, used the numbers right. to then try and get dirt on other mps but the bit that's weird to me is the best you're going to get from another mp is what you've already got from william rag and you're quite unlikely to get it from another mp so why don't you just what did you want in the first place and why don't you just get that from the guy mm. who you've already got this piece of compromise over so the whole I thing mean, is somewhat strange I guess then- in that case, it's probably just something to sit on so that if and when the day comes and you happen to have, you have this, mm. this sitting with you it, and that you think that William Rag or whoever, you know, he, from what we know, they weren't able to get it from anyone else, these compromising um, images. Well, but two two other Tory MPs have apparently on. sent nudes. Oh wow! Okay, but they might be so the then, kind of ho- they might be the kind of hot nudes yeah. that I'm talking about, where you don't mind if they get leaked. So maybe I mean, it's not actually. <laughs> no, I think everyone should release their nudes so that no one can be blackmailed by it ever again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's probably something to sit on, so that when the time comes, you know, they can get whatever it is that they want out of them. You know, just because they have it, you know, they're prob- it's probably something that you know, you can hold over their heads for a long period of time and hope that one day it will materialize into something, you know, something useful. Um, But yeah, like I said, I'm just really surprised that MPs don't have like a basic kind of training that is like, look, do what you're going to do, live your life as normally as you can, but like, be careful about giving compromising stuff. And if you're going to give, like you said, we, I know that you're not supposed to include your face and like, and I've gotten nothing really. So if you're like an MP, you should have like basic cybersecurity awareness, like, especially again, because you should be super vulnerable. You are super vulnerable to this. And the fact that, and you should, there should be procedures for that. If that is breached, because, you know, people slip up, whatever, there's a protocol to go through that doesn't involve just giving whatever a blackmailer um, wants. But, you know, I, I am very curious to hear, especially that you're saying that it sounded like it was someone who was in this the circle. Um, you know, what if he's from a news if they're from a newspaper or something, like what media outlet are they from? Like that's a huge ethical violation. I wonder if we'll, surely some tech person, some computer scientist somewhere can figure it out for us. Yeah, because everyone knows the number now. Like I've got the number, and all the all the journalists have this number. So maybe I don't know if you can get give the number to a private investigator who can then work out who had it where. But this is beyond my pay grade. Um, we should say the photos they were using. We also know is um, they were it was of a I think a anyway two completely unrelated people whose whose photos they were were sending to people. It was from someone's Facebook like ten years ago. Um, two police forces are investigating the Met and. Leicestershire. Oh, I wonder if I should be giving them advice. Uh, they're very free to give me a call. Uh, the scammer has my, everyone apparently has my number. Uh, so maybe they can find me. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei has today used an Eid speech to hit out at Israel following their bombing of the Iranian consulate in Damascus 10 days ago. The wicked Zionist regime made another mistake and staged an attack on Iran's consulate, which means an attack on the country's soil, a violation of international norm. It made a mistake, and the regime needs to be punished and will be punished. Israel's Foreign Minister Israel Katz has responded with a message posted on Twitter in both Hebrew and Farsi. So the message said this, If Iran attacks from its territory, 
Israel will react and attack in Iran. And then he's added um, the Ayatollah Khamenei. I love sort of diplomacy done by sort of atting people um, on Twitter. Um, earlier today, I spoke to Trita Parsi, Vice President of the Quincy Institute and a world leading expert on Israel-Iran relations. I began by asking him what we should make of this latest war of words. I think uh, two critical things comes out of this. First of all, Khamenei has now himself said that the attack on the consulate is tantamount to an attack on Iranian soil, and as a result, there will be an Iranian response. Now, that still doesn't mean that they will do something next week or the magnitude or the scale of it. He did not say much about that. But he confirmed that this is viewed and treated by Iran as an attack on Iranian soil, which then is a violation of Iran's very clear red line, which the Israelis knew about. Secondly, you have this other interesting statement by the Israeli foreign minister in Hebrew and in Persian. And tw on Twitter, in which he says that an attack by Iran from Iran will be responded to by Israel with an attack on Iran. Now, here's where this is interesting. The Iranians don't have the capacity of flying fly fighter jets to attack Israel from Iranian soil. They do have extensive ballistic missiles capabilities with tremendous accuracy that they would fire on Israel in this scenario, most likely, or uh, in, in a combination perhaps with a drone attack. It seems like the Israelis are signaling the Iranians that if Iran goes to that extent and uses ballistic missiles, then Israel will have no choice but to respond by doing an attack on Iranian soil, which could be against military facilities, it could be against the nuclear facilities, um, uh, which, of course, would further escalate matters. The question then is, does the Israeli foreign minister by that signal that if there is an attack by Iranian proxies, allies, partners, whatever word you want to use to describe them, on Israel in response to what the Israelis did in Damascus, meaning it wouldn't be ballistic missiles, but it would be drones and things of that nature, that in that scenario, the Israelis would not escalate further by doing another attack on Iranian soil. It's not entirely clear if that is what it was meant, but if it is what it was meant, it may offer a potential way for the Iranians to respond without necessarily eliciting an, Iran an Israeli attack on Iranian soil proper, which then would bring us probably deep into a regional war. It does seem somewhat strange, this statement from the Israeli foreign minister, because it, it, the concern with where the weapons come from, not where they end up, might seem a bit surprising, because I suppose you could read into that. Well, what if there's a ballistic missile from Iranian soil, but it lands somewhere outside of Israel, say, you know, an, an Israeli consulate somewhere? Where would that fall within this matrix? It, it seems like the message he was saying, again, this is a tweet with essentially just one sentence, suggests that what they, what they are putting as a red line is that the attack actually would be a ballistic missile. Because that's what it really means that it's saying that it would be an attack from Iranian soil. That's the only capacity the Iranians essentially have to do an attack from their own soil. And that that's the Israeli red line. If it is a smaller attack with drones, other things may still, you know, constitute a lot of damage on Israel. Uh, but that is something that would get a lesser response, if any major response at all from the Israelis. Now, that is what has been said publicly. We do not know what the messaging has been privately. And there have been messages exchanged between the Iranians and the Israelis over the course of the last 40 plus years in which they officially have had no communication. So we don't know what's been said privately about this. If that message is more clear, perhaps even contradictory, I think it should be noteworthy that this is a statement coming from the foreign minister, not the defense minister in Israel. We're 10 days on from that sort of an initial attack in, in Damascus on the Iranian consulate. Are we any clearer what that was about? You know, why did the Israelis think it was worth taking that risk towards escalation? Were they actually looking for escalation or did, that they, or, or did they just think that the the military target in that consulate was of such high value that it was worth risking escalation. Do you have a sort of sense of, uh, of what actually happened there? What were their motives? 
I don't buy the idea that this was some sort of an unexpected opportunity and they decided to take it even though it would violate a major Iranian red line and be a major escalation. I think, first of all, the Israelis have been looking for an escalation. If you just take a look at what Galant, the Israeli the defense minister, said just a few days before this, he said that we're entering a new phase in which Israel is going to go on the offensive against Hezbollah. So I think this was part of what they had planned to do, because I think a key thing that we have to keep in mind in all of this, which is, again, part of the reason why Biden's strategy has been so problematic, in my view, is that the Israelis, and particularly Netanyahu in, uh, himself, have not favored de-escalation. He actually wants an escalation. He wants a longer war, and he wants a broader war, because he recognizes that the minute this war ends, not only does his political career end, his prison sentence is likely to begin at that same moment because of the criminal charges that are filed against him. So prolonging the war, expanding the war, serves his interest. And we have to also keep in mind, for more than 20 years, Netanyahu has tried to get the United States to attack Iran militarily. If he elicits a major response from the Iranians, he may have a second bear hug from Biden at a moment in which Biden is at least rhetorically starting to put pressure on Netanyahu and the Israeli government. If the Iranians inflict damage on Israel in such a way that it will once again elicit this instinct on the American side to always side with Israel, he may get a second bite at the bear hug apple, so to say, um, and perhaps even compel the United States to be directly involved in this war against Iran. So the opportunity for a broader war with Iran that could suck the U.S. into it, which is something by, uh, Netanyahu has been pushing for for more than 20 years, he may actually be looking at the best opportunity yet for such an expansion of the war. And this is part of the reason why Biden's approach towards Israel and Gaza has been so problematic, because, and we can go into it in greater detail, but the structure of the negotiations, the demand, the linkage between a ceasefire and the release of the hostages presumes that the Israelis actually prioritize releasing the hostages. And if you ask the Israeli public, you will see a lot of people inside the Israeli public, as well as inside the Israeli government, very vo vocally criticize the Israeli government right now, the Netanyahu government, for not prioritizing the release of the hostages. Yet Biden's strategy is tied to what Netanyahu wants to do. He's essentially letting Netanyahu take the lead, even though Netanyahu's goals may be very different from those of I mean, this all puts Iran in presumably a very difficult position. If, if, if the Israelis are trying to provoke a response which might draw the Americans into an attack on Iran, clearly the Iranians don't want to, I mean, it doesn't seem like they want to start a war with Israel, let alone the, the United States, right? So, so they're in this difficult position. And I suppose, is that why we haven't seen a response yet? For me, sort of, if a foreign embassy or a foreign consulate gets bombed and there's no response for 10 days, that seems somewhat surprising. Although, I suppose I'm I'm not expert in this in this kind of thing. Is it normal for a country to wait, you know, over ten days to retaliate when um, their their territory has been compromised? There's a reason why um, it's difficult for us to be able to say whether it's normal or not because it's completely abnormal for an embassy to be bombed. What the Israelis did is a complete and flagrant violation of the Vienna Convention. This just simply does not happen. Uh, so now that it's happened, uh, of course we're seeing um, that some sort of a response will likely come from the Iranians. They have absorbed a lot of other hits before without doing much, which has been criticized by hardliners inside of Iran who believe that this has weakened Iran's deterrence. The Mexican embassy was attacked by the Ecuadorians just a couple of days later, and the Mexicans immediately filed a complaint at the ICJ. Uh, and of course, the situation between them is different, so a military response was obviously never in the cards, but they responded rather fast. The Iranians have made it very clear that what's important to them is that there will be a response, that it will be the right response rather than that it will be a hasty response. Um, but having said that, I think it should be quite clear there are tensions inside the Iranian regime in which a lot of hardliners essentially are saying the only reason why the Israelis could do this is precisely because the Iranians didn't respond to so many other things that Israel had done in attacking Iran before. And as a result, the Israelis just kept on moving forward and that they will continue to do so until 
there is some sort of a response that restores a degree of deterrence. It's the very same logic the Biden administration used when they decided to go and um, use a significant amount of kinetic force against the Houthis and Iraqi militias after three American soldiers were killed at that air base in Jordan. Is there a scenario where this sort of risky game backfires and sort of Netanyahu provokes a war with the Iranians? The Iranians do, you know, respond. They say, we've got no choice but to escalate now. Or maybe there are parts of the regime that do want to escalate. And then the Americans say, actually, you know, you're on your own. And then that would be presumably somewhat of a of a disaster for the Israelis if they've opened up a new front but don't have any more backing from from the United States. Is that remotely possible? I do think it's possible. I think the Israelis, given how Biden has been so differential to the Israelis for the last six months, and even earlier on throughout his entire presidency, this is part of the reason why the JCPA was now revived, um, may believe that that scenario is very, very unlikely. I'm not so sure that it is that unlikely, because if this ends up actually dragging the U.S. into a war that three American presidents have actually tried to avoid, actually four, despite the fact that many of them have been very hawkish, this will go extremely badly with the American populace, including Biden's own base, who he already has tremendous tensions with right now, particularly the Gen Z and the younger components of that base, as well as African-American voters. If, If Biden, because of this unstrategic, unwise, foolish deference to Netanyahu, actually gets the U.S. dragged into a war, a major regional war with Iran, that will be the end of Biden's presidency. Whether he will wake up to it or not, of course, is a different story, mindful of the fact that he hasn't really woken up to how much damage he has done himself to his own re-election bid and to America standing in the world with this ridiculous and really indefensible defense uh, and support for Israel throughout all of these uh, six months. That was Trita Parsi speaking to me earlier today. Um, Dahlia, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I loved your commentary on nude pics. I know. Release them all. <laughs> There's lots of support <laughs> for that position answer. in the comments I saw. <laughs> the, the the moment where we all collectively <laughs> release all of our nudes, people seem to have a, a lot of enthusiasm for. <laughs> God, a deviant group we are. <laughs> Navarra Live audience members. <laughs> I'm not sure it would suddenly end all blackmail, but uh, it might go some way towards that. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.